Um, first of all, everyone, uh, to everyone, the name of uh, Louis Latour should be familiar. Um, but just a teeny bit of background. Um, it is uh, a long established and still family business. Um, the first uh, Louis Latour vineyards were established 270 years ago in 1751. And Maison Louis Latour itself, um, just over 40 years later in 1797. Um, altogether, um, the Maison has got 48 hectares in Burgundy, uh, of which 27 are Grand Cru, and that's the largest holding of Grand Cru in the Côte d'Or. And um, it, the Maison makes 169 different wines uh, from Burgundy, Beaujolais Var and the Ardèche from its own domains. So it's a, it's a fascinating company. Uh, Christophe has been um, in charge since 2017. Um, he joined the company in 2011 as technical director uh, and was appointed director of Domaine Louis Latour in 2017. He's got a very uh, starry background. Uh, he trained at the prestigious Agronomic Institute in Paris and then began his career as an onologist in Bordeaux at Chateau Félin Ségur. Then he went off to, um, uh, he worked for the uh, French National Institute of Agricultural Research and then went off to the New World, um, traveling to Tasmania and vinifying the wines at Piper's Brook. Then back to Burgundy and he worked for various domains there before uh, joining Louis Latour. And since then, um, he's um, been uh, developing the uh, domain's long practice sustainability, uh, um, well, all it does to good things to keep as green as possible. And um, his search for excellence um, is a daily pursuit to quote the uh, website, whose aim is to produce wines of stature, finesse, and elegance. So let's meet Christoph and start tasting some lovely wines. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So um, we'll host that tasting with Kate from our PR. Um, the idea was to taste various Pinot Noir done by Maison Latour from the south the north and we try to highlight um, the decision we made in both the places we choose and the kind of pinot we've planted in those places to try to achieve the best wines possible in those places. So we'll start with the Val which is you know uh, 400 kilometers south of Boone and so you'll see that we try to be higher in altitude to keep some freshness in there. Uh, then we'll go to Pierre Doré, which is the south of Beaujolais, where there is limestone. And uh, you'll see that there also we try to do a bit of uh, <laughs> altitude playing. And then back to Burgundy with Pissin, Riossois, and Eancy. Okay? Is that on the right, Pete? I, yeah, that sounds absolutely perfect. Can I just check that people can see the PowerPoint display that I've just put up on the screen? Yeah. Yep. Yep. yeah. We've got the full on one now, though, Kate, not the. We've got the one yeah, with all the. We have your screen, not the presentation. Ah, OK. I've, I've swapped it the wrong way. OK, hold on a second. We had the non, we had the one before. Is that better? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's great. Okay. That's it. Thank you, everybody. So. We're beginning, I think, Christoph, with the Bellevue. Is that what you wanted to do? Um, yeah, why not? I would have started with the Valmes, the ordinary Valmesine. Yeah. Then we can start with ordinary Valmesine. There we go. Your wish is okay. my command. So, as I said, Valmesine is 400 kilometers south of Bonn. Um, it's in the Var region, and but uh, not next to Bondol, very near the sea, but at the very north stop of the VAR department, uh, near the Gorge du Verdon, uh, at the very beginning of the Alps, in fact. We are the first vineyard we planted there was at 480 meters, and the last one we've planted 
is almost 600 meters, which you see is probably two to 300 meters higher than what we have here in Burgundy. Obviously, we're deep in the south, so to keep some French freshness and balance, we had to go up uh, in altitude. So, so this is this is an area, Christoph, that it gets incredibly hot during the day in the summer, but it's saved, isn't it, by its altitude so that it has the really cool nights. Yeah, it has really cool nights and even the days are far cooler than there in Bondol or, uh, or there, because you know, usually we lose 0 0.6 to 1 degree Celsius when you go 100 meter higher. So you see that probably compared to Bondol, we are maybe two to three degrees cooler all year long. And, and that's we, why we don't do more vet, but Pinot there. Yeah, I, I was going to say, are we the only ones doing Pinot in this area? Because this was a brand new planting of Pinot when we moved to the area. Uh, yes. was, yeah. Almost like Chardonnay and Ardèche, we arrived with the Pinot. And now I think we have two or three colleagues doing, doing Pinot there, but we are mostly the only Pinot producer in the Val. And when you when you chose when Latour chose to go here, um, was this based on soils as well? Um, it's because I think um, if I'm right in saying the area is um, limestone, um, but is it a, is it a kind of similar soil to what you would find on the Cote d'Or? Yeah, contrary to most of the wine we'll taste, um, the soils are limestone, but from a, a tiny bit older than uh, what you can find in Burgundy, which is middle Jurassic, like uh, Bajocien and Batonia. And here it's Pliocene. It's a small bit older and you have a, a bit more mild than we have, uh, at least for Pinot Noir in Burgundy. But it's limestone and the mild uh, helps us keep freshness because it keeps water. Because in the Val we have um, quite a lot of water during the winter and even early spring. And the issue is often to manage this hydric stress during summer because summer gets hot and with very little um, rainfall. Mm -hmm. And so the planting... Sorry? From right from the... So you were starting in the, in the VAR completely with a blank piece of paper. That's it. Um, yeah. Did you, yeah. So, did you use um, clones from from your vineyards in the Cote d'Or to plant with? And did you use similar spacing um, in the vineyards? No. So, uh, well, let's talk down to earth a bit. The thing is, the var, uh, the idea behind the var and the Ardèche was for Maison Louis Latour to be able to. Uh, provide our customer a wine that is around the price of a, a Bourgogne Pinot Noir, but uh, of probably at least the idea at the beginning at, in the 90s where sourcing very good Pinot Noir is quite, quite challenging to provide a wine with a very sustainable quality. Uh, and so we went south to have a bit less problems to ripen the grapes and um, with techniques that are a, a bit uh, more traditional to the south than to Burgundy with larger spacing, two meters, two meter 50 uh, between the rows um, to be able to provide the kind of pricing we want to have. Yeah. Okay, so if people um, would like to taste their, if they haven't already, the Valmazine um, Pinot Noir, that, so that, let's say that the basic, I don't like to say basic, but um, the, the, the Val Valmazine, not the Bellevue. Um, Christoph, can you just talk us about uh, through the winemaking for this wine? Um, yes, so in there we also stick to, to the way of the land because uh, we, we bought a, a whole cup uh, in the VAR to make our wine, so it's Concrete tanks, quite high volume compared to what you can find in Burgundy. But there, yeah, it's pumping over once a day, no more than that. 
And uh, as always with Maison Latour, no cool um, maceration, just nicely starting and uh, then going through the process with one pumping over a day, not too much extraction. You know the style of the house. We want fresh and easy going wines on that level, not too much extraction. And so we'll, um, we'll have that kind of thing. And once the ferment is over, as soon as it's over, we uh, take the wine, assemble good and press, and we'll keep that nine months in the concrete tanks and then bottling it. So no oak. Um, no oak. Just straightforward. And I have to say, tasting the 2018 um, I can't remember if I've tasted this before. I think it's tasting delicious. Um, one question come in from Amanda um, is asking about the land cost. And it's a good question um, in this. I will say this part of the VAR because certain parts of the VAR down on the coast near Saint-Tropez are extremely expensive when it comes to land costs. Um, but with the assumption is what is, you know, what is the comparison um, in price per hectare here uh, as as opposed to price for land in Burgundy, and I can imagine it's quite a difference. If you compare the price of land for um, Bourgogne Pinot Noir, we, you would probably be three or four times cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. Meaning maybe. 15,000 euro an hectare for uh, the VAR and 50 for uh, Bourgogne Pinot Noir. Yeah. So when we in this quest to make a, an affordable, consistent Pinot Noir, it's it's um it's a perfect place. Hmm. And it's also beautiful. And we can see here from the um, the pictures these interesting kind of red soils that you get in the area as well. Yeah. And you know in Burgundy what we say is that red soil, red wines, white soil, white wines. So <laughs> it works quite well. Yeah. And is that the, the town in this photograph? Is that the town of Moissac in the background? Yeah. Yeah. So for our listeners, um, this area is, um, it's probably about 70 kilometers inland from Saint-Tropez. And um, it's actually well known for its truffles. Um, there's, a, there's a truffle festival, isn't there? Which I think actually, I don't know whether it's one of those things that when you imagine, but I always sort of get this truffly, truffly nature in the wines as well. Um, questions, questions, lots of questions coming in. When did we start planting um, here at Valmazine? The first planting was 1989, if I'm not wrong. Okay, thank you. And um, are there, are there um, big vintage differences between uh, the Var and Burgundy? Yeah, for example, here you're tasting 2018 and you probably have the image of a very ripe uh, and rich vintage, which is the case in Burgundy. And uh, for uh, Valmoisin, it's probably been one of the worst vintage of the last 20 years. We had like uh, lots and lots of rain during the whole season. I remember uh, Charles managed the vintage there, sending me a picture of him driving the tractor and his wheel. You didn't see the soil. He was driving and it was in the water. There was huge amount of water and, and we had a bit of problems with uh, gray rot and had to sort grapes a lot. Yeah, it, it's been quite an awful vintage, which is uh, the exact opposite of what we had in Burgundy. And yet they still probably, managed to... You know, at, on the contrary, for example, the 2007 is a so-so vintage in Burgundy, probably, where in the south of France and in the Var, it, it was an amazing vintage. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, very, very different climates. Yeah. And a question, a, a, a very, um, a question from Sumi, why do you pump over rather than punch down your ferments? Uh, first of all, uh, this won't be a very sexy answer, but 
it's more a matter of logistics when you have uh, tanks that are two to three hundred hectoliters punching them down it needs like far bigger muscles than the one i have so <laughs> that's why we do pumping over and and it's the same thing as it's concrete tank and um, you know there is just a small hole at the top and so you can't go everywhere to do the pinching down. So now we are making some trials to break down the cap, um, impulsing um, nitrogen in, uh, in the wine to just do a bit more uh, uh, movement and uh, maybe uh, more mixing it than we can do with the pumping over. But yeah, it's more a question of logistics than uh, technical, I'm sorry. It may not be a sexy answer, but it's a practical answer. So um, thank you, thank you, Christoph. Shall we move on to the Bellevue? Um, and this is a new introduction as of the, I think 2018 vintage. This is the 2019. Yeah. I'll just flick up so people can see. Oh so, yeah, as, as Kate was saying, so um, a fair part of our vineyard is very, just next to the village of uh, Moissac Bellevue. And so that's where the name Bellevue comes from. And it's uh, a selection of uh, the best parts of the cuvee of Valmoisine. And uh, usually we're trying to have a bit more extraction um, and, uh, and more, um, yeah, style maybe who, uh, looks more uh, maybe Jeunesse Chambertin than uh, Volnay to make a burgundy nice assumption. I get quite a tomato y sort of um, nose on this wine, a lot more than I did on the, on the, on the Valmazine. Yeah, and usually we are more in a, on a, a bit more on a precious style with. Um, maybe Arum is a bit less um, ripe and a bit fresher. Yeah, yeah, it's slightly grippier in the, in the mouth, I think. An interesting question from Vivian as to whether um, climate change will, will uh, have, make, make Pinot Noir unviable in time. Will it become too hot to grow Pinot Noir even at the altitude that we're at? That's a good question. And um, as I said, from the very first planting 330 years ago and now the last planting we made, we have already been 120 meter higher and we're already looking for places 50 or 100 meters higher. Because by the way, we, we see changes and where we were usually picking second week of September 30 years ago, we are now more picking last week of August. Wow. So it's still, it's seldom compared to us, but it's still um, quite um, viable at the moment, at least, because it's high in altitude. Uh, there is a bit more water and also, uh, you know, in here we are very continental climate in Burgundy, and I think continental climate is probably the one suffering the most from climate change. Where uh, in the Var we are, as you said, 70 kilometers from the Mediterranean Sea, and so there is some um, tampon effect of uh, the sea that makes the climate change less violent there probably than it is in Burgundy. Yeah, yeah. Do you get the after the, the breezes? Does is it quite a windy spot um, at Valmazine? Is there a lot of mistral or anything blowing through as well? Yeah, yeah. Less than Ardesh probably because you're a bit protected by the Alps as you're very near uh, the Alps. But there is a bit of wind. Yeah, yeah. there is a bit of wind. And also to talk about climate change, we. Um, have been changing. Uh, you know, at first when we arrived in the bar, we were planting the exact same thing as we are planting here. And nowadays 
Uh, and it's, a, it's very interesting for us because it's, it gave us in Burgundy a return on what works well, but we have been now for more than 10 years planting um, rootstock, uh, which is more suited to the south, like uh, 1,103 1, Paulson and uh, 140 root jerry and things like that. We are very usual in Languedoc and we don't know well as a, as a, a Burgundian. And so we see how it works in Valmachine and we are now trying to do the same thing in Bergen, in Burgundy to see how it will work. Mm. Mm. So it allows you to experiment. Um, yeah. in we, are, we are happy enough to be able to make experiments with 100 hectares. Yeah, nice. Nice to be able to do that. Um, Wooden, wood, uh, is there any oak used in the Bellevue at all? Or yeah, we are, I, I forgot to mention that difference, but we are uh, 15 to 25% uh, oak. So it's not, we've never been very happy with 100% uh, new oak in, uh, in the bar because you know, it's often a bit riper and older than what we do in Burgundy. And we feel that we must protect the wine from oxygen more than we do in Burgundy, probably. But for the Bellevue, which is a bit more muscular, a bit more full body than Valmoisine, a little bit of oak gives a, a, a nice touch. Smashing, thank you. If there are, are no more questions or comments, if there's anything else that Christophe you want to say about this, or shall we move travel? get in the car and travel slightly further north. Um, we'll move on. If everybody's fine, we can move to the north. So we'll move on to wine number three. So it's a Pinot Noir Les Pierre Doré, which is a, a Coteau Bourguignon coming from uh, the south of Beaujolais. So uh, south of Beaujolais is uh, where we is limestone, the same kind of limestone as Côte d'Or because uh, our plots, for example, are on the Bajorchin soil, which is the exact same soil limestone than in the Chambertin, for example. So um, often people think uh, granite when they think Beaujolais, then the south of Beaujolais, the part is, which is Beaujolais, not Beaujolais village, but Beaujolais, is a uh, limestone and it's called the Pierre Doré because it's that very beautiful golden stone um, which is limestone where you can find lots of lots of small oysters and things. Yeah I think this I think this picture that we have on screen now is a really nice illustration of um, of the local rock and it's it's sort of I think they call it don't they the little Tuscany it's kind of the houses are built of this rock and yeah. actually incredibly pretty um, and it's really only what 30 minutes from from Lyon, Lyon Airport. Mm, yeah, probably. I, I, I know I've driven it a couple of times now. Normally in a hurry, trying to catch a plane. Um, so this is a this is a, a, a new area for Pinot Noir for you. Um, I think we introduced this wine with the two commercially. I think with the 2015 vintage. Good point for you. Um, and so uh, Louis Latour moved into this area a few years back, um, probably slightly secretly before people cottoned on to the fact that there was some Pinot Noir and you have planted new vineyards here. Um, but also there were a couple of established vineyards here which were growing Pinot Noir sort of slightly in secret. Um, so there are a few, um, older vines here as well is that correct Christoph? Yeah. yeah yeah we when we came one of the first thing we did uh, was to buy a plot of Pinot Noir we found that was planted in the 70s for example so most of the wine you taste comes from young vines planted from 2011 to 2015 but um, there is a, also some old vines we found like 1970, for example. So yeah, people, you know, that's uh, historical. Beaujolais is a part of Burgundy, even if some of them, my colleagues are not very happy with that idea. Uh, 
and um, it's always been part and as there has always been Gamay in Cote d'Or, there has always been Pinot Noir in the Beaujolais, you know, because uh, vignerons and winemakers loves to experiment and play a bit. So by the way, I mean, even if you're uh, anywhere in the Beaujolais, you'd like to have a bit of Pinot Noir just for fun at least. I hear the I hear the owner of the vineyard uh, had um, had lost had lost the paperwork um, that that said it was uh, that had said it was Pinot Noir and so it was <laughs> officially it was it was Gamay but actually it was Pinot Noir all along. <laughs> I can't talk about that. <laughs> so this is um, uh, sorry go, just going back to um, the south of France again the the appellation for those wines is. Um, IGP um, ah. the VAR. Um, but this is Coteau Bourguignon, which is a new um, appellation controller that was brought in in, I think, 2011. That's it. Um, and so stretches and allows us to make Pinot Noir and, and market Pinot Noir from this, from this part of um, Greater Burgundy, shall we call it. Yeah. Yeah, it was a bit of a, a trade off between the Beaujolais and the, Bur and the Burgundy. Uh, because, you know, prior to 2011, it was possible to produce um, Bourgogne, 100% Gamay, coming from the Cru of the Beaujolais. And uh, people from Côte d'Or especially wanted to hand that. And uh, so they invented Bourgogne Pinot Noir and Bourgogne Gamay, which is a Cru Beaujolais usually uh, uh, sold Bourgogne Gamay and then Coteau Bourguignon, where uh, you can have um, almost any wines produced from Chablis uh, to Lyon. Okay, thank you. And so at this point, um, we're obviously quite a lot further south from. Um, we are 140 kilometers south of uh, Bern. And so there again, we played a bit of the altitude and uh, we are between 320 to 400 meters, so 50, 100 meter higher than we are here in, uh, in Burgundy. So the idea there was also that we go a bit south, so we have to be a bit higher to preserve freshness and not ripening too early. Yeah, yeah. And there, there is, and I think there's almost that kind of Beaujolais freshness, that crunchiness of acidity and a, and a kind of cherry nature of the wines that whilst it's not specifically Gamay and Beaujolais, it has that kind of Beaujolais freshness, I think, to it. Yeah, that's, I, I, I can't really explain why, but m most of the time, even my colleagues say, oh, I know you put some Gamay in there. And, but there's none, and probably, yeah, as you said, the terroir is talking there because you find that kind of freshness of uh, zesty acidity, probably. And all years, even 2018, that was very ripe here. And we're here, we're really on a Burgundian profile in terms of the climate we had and the kind of ripeness we reached. Yeah. Yeah, and um, and we are so we are using a little bit of oak with this wine, I think. Sorry, Kate. That's okay. Yes, but like the Bellevue, 15, 20 percent, 25. But it's uh, it's really a hint. It's not a, a massive because of volumes and also because of the pricing and the kind of wine we want to produce. We, we like, you know, Lato likes to have like kind of a very fruity and easy going Pinot. So this is this is part of this continuing quest to um, to keep the Louis Latour fans yeah. um, and followers supplied with reasonably priced um, Pinot Noir. Yeah, as, as Louis well, Fabrice would tell you, this is our origin. He said, wow, it is, he always says that his grandfather was saying that you can't manage a business if you can't go there and be back for dinner. So <laughs> South of Beaujolais is 
one hour and a half from them, so it's okay. You're always back for dinner. And at the Be same time, the land price is very low, sadly. And But you have lots of people there that know how to drive a vineyard. Um, you know, when we arrived in the Var, there used to be lots of vineyards uh, in the north of the Var. But when we arrived, most had disappeared because at the moment, rosé was not a big thing and people were not having money. And so most of the vineyard had already disappeared. Where in the Beaujolais, we arrived hopefully earlier in the process and there are still lots of people. And so, which means that there is an economy, there are suppliers, there are um, uh, people you can hire that know the job. Uh, there are people interested in planting and uh, doing the same thing as we do to create a dynamic in that region. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, sorry, it's a few questions coming in. Uh, what are the alcohol levels? So, um, yeah, so soon he's asking about the alcohol um whether they're riper and are they touching 14 percent um, no yeah we are at certain point five right. and usually that's where we aim to be on that kind of wine yeah yeah and uh, mark yes we're on wine three which is the les pierres doré um just just to the south of the um of the beaujolais region um yeah, thanks, Amanda. Um, the, for those of you that have got your tasting sheets, I know they were a bit late on in the day. Um, there are the alcohols and also suggested um, suggested retail prices. So the first the first three wines we've tasted have all been um, well. The, the Valmazine was actually um, about fourteen pounds, and then the Bellevue is um, low twenties, and this this Pierre Doré is about eighteen quid. So this is all. Um, you know, accessible, accessibly priced um, Pinot, Pinot Noir for Pinot Noir fans. So um, hopefully you're enjoying, um, enjoying these. I, I, I really like this. There's a plushness as well to this Pierre Doré, which I think is really tasty. Um, you know, that ripeness, it's, it's delicious. Should we, um, so Amanda is, is being very helpful in putting all the, um, all the details into the chat if people want to um, go into the chat. Thanks, Amanda. Um, if we're done for comments on, on the Pierre Doré or any questions, um, we'll get in our car again and head north again to a new wine for me. Um, so I'm going to be quiet and let, uh, and let Christophe, I'm even gonna have to practice how to say this because it's not fixing. Um, is Fissin, um, and we're on the 2019, which is newly released. Um, I think we were sort of launching 2019s at the beginning of the year. Um, and this is a, as I say, I've never tasted this before. Well, Fissin is a... Um... <laughs> Just between Marsanet and uh, and Jura Chambertin, it's a new release uh, in the um, in the portfolio of uh, Louis Latour. We find some good grape sources uh, since a few years, and so now we're selling a Fissin. It's a small village. Uh, it's uh, Bajochin soil, so it's the same kind of soil that we have in Corton. So usually it's uh, a bit um, more um, earthy than um, Gevray. You're right on the earthiness. It, it immediately has a much more Burgundian nose. It's less of the sort of black ripe fruits that we were having further south. Mm. 
And is this um is this a parcel that we um we work with the grower? Um, it's not something we own, is it? It's or, or yeah. what? We, we source the grapes there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the winemaking is um just traditional open vats, I think, and then a um a, sh a not too long oak barrel aging um afterwards. No, you know, in two thousand nineteen is probably seven eight months in barrel no more than that what was what was 2019 like um as a vintage i i think we discussed it and um it, it, you lost a few or you've got a, a few gray hairs over this one yeah it's been a very complicated year we had a many frost events at the very beginning of april and the 5th of april then the 14th of april and even on the 5th of May, we again had a bit of cool mornings. And after that, it's been really cool until the second half of June. I remember at the very beginning of June, we had mornings at three or four degrees, which wow. is very low and drive the the, the vines to very poorly grow and had a very poor flowering. And which mean that uh, after that, from the 15th of June to the 15th of September, we had a very great weather and, and the end of the season was almost perfect. But all of the very important moment, except for harvest went bad between the 15th of June and that. And so we ended up with a very, poor um, um, yield yeah. in the village appellation usually less than 20 hectoliters per hectare uh, wow good and also when making the wines we were very surprised because probably because of the hot weather and a bit of draft um, the phenolics weren't as um, extractable and easy coming that we would have uh, imagined and you know because it was very small berries very low yield so we were expecting like to have very big wines and in the end they ended up more looking for me more 2017 than they were looking 2018 which is quite surprising but whatever we did during the winemaking period during the ferment the color didn't come as we thought it would Tannins didn't came and we saw it would. And so we made lighter ones than we, one would expect from how the grapes were looking. Yeah. Yeah, there is, there's a jealous, there is a delicacy to this. Yeah. Um, rumors, rumors commented that she thinks Fisan is becoming more popular. Um, is it sort of one of the more affordable um, villages on the Cote de Nuit? Um, is, do, you, do we think that this is sort of Slightly, I, I think it's slightly lesser known than a lot of the, the, the bigger, you know, the bigger local villages. Yeah, yeah, it's, it sits somewhere between Marsanet and uh, Gervais Chambertin, both in terms of quality, reputation, and in terms of price. Yeah. But it's still Cote d'Or pricing, it's still relatively expensive. <laughs> I'm not the one making the price. No, <laughs> we're not, we won't blame you, Christoph. Um, but yes, lovely herbal, savory character is the comment. So yeah, delicious. Yeah, we have a very nice wine. And I think maybe 2017 and a bit less, but also 2019 might be a bit overlooked, for, at least for the reds. But I think they're, they're really nice vintage and kind of wine I like also, because maybe they look like more traditional burgundy than 2018 maybe mm -hmm. and you know we try and we love restaurants and we try to sell a lot in restaurants which is not really a good idea nowadays but we, we stick to it. restaurants <laughs> <laughs> we stick to that we still believe in restaurants and i think it's really nice ones for restaurants because you don't have to let them sit in a cellar for 20 years before being able to enjoy them no, this is this is super drinkable now. Actually, um, I, I, I can tell this is going to go nicely. I've got I've got salmon for dinner tonight, and this I think this will be a really nice match for that. Um, 
So yes, lovely. Thank you. And that's that's been a nice nice new discovery for me, and I hope it I hope it was for everybody else tasting um, tasting the wine. Um, so we're going to get back in the car again. Um, yeah, and go up and drive a little further north. Yeah. Um, shall we do Ihansi first? Uh, if we want to go up north, we'll end up with Ihansi and okay. make that taste uh, the Delia de Pinot. Okay, so let's go to Losquar, um, which I'm, I'm expecting, I'm anticipating that most of our audience will not be familiar with the Coteau de Losquar. Um, it was um, a fairly, should I say it's one of these areas that's been rediscovered. Um, once upon a time, it, back in the late 1800s, it was a big wine growing area. Um, yeah, there there, there used to be more than 4,000 hectares of vineyard in Oswa, which is in Côte d'Or, in the very north of Côte d'Or, a bit next to the Yonne department, not very far from Chablis. And um, there it's, um, uh, people might know about the Morvan, and Morvan are hills and mountains in Burgundy, but it's granitic soils, where Oswa is next to the Morvan, but it's limestone hills. And there used to be, you know, all of the places between the hills are uh, west facing where for a uh, Charolais beef and the south and east facing places were for vines. It disappeared after the Phylloxera crisis. And nowadays there is probably 40 hectares of which we own between a third and the half of all of the vineyard in Moussoua. And this is made under the Simone Fevre label, which is the house um, that Louis Latour purchased, uh, the, the Chablis house that Louis Latour purchased in 2003. Um, they're based in Chitri, their, their winery is based in Chitri, although they also have an old winery and visitor centre in downtown Chablis. Um, very well known for their Cremant de, de, de Bourgogne um, and were established in sort of 1840, I think, is, is, so it's a very long, long-standing Chablis house. Um, so this is interesting because this is actually not a Louis Latour wine, but a Simone Fevre wine. Um, and uh, I think 100% um, Pinot Noir, but very, very different character here. So you see here, it's the same altitude as we have in Côte d'Or, but it's 25, 30 kilometers further north than Dijon. And so a bit probably old style Pinot Noir with very light color. You can see that it's very, very, very light, but still very ripe aromas. Yeah. But, but much redder fruit aromas, much more in the, for me, in the, um, in the spectrum of, of sort of um, red currants, um, sort of that, that lighter, almost a slightly cranberry-ish um, character as well. But yeah, I really assume it's like, it's, um, the aromas are a bit plummy. Mm. Mm. But yeah, much more um, in terms in certainly on the here in my mouth, a, a lot more of it, that acidity. But um, you have good acidity. Yeah. Quite light body, which makes for a very easy going Pinot. And um, for most of our colleagues, it's very surprising because making red wine is the Oswa is probably for 90% of the people in, uh, in Cote d'Or, it's just, if you do that, you're probably a bit mad. <laughs> and this is again one of these areas, a little bit like Pierre Doré, um, that was a bit forgotten. And uh, Louis Latour came in, probably in a in sunglasses and a hat, so that nobody recognised them. 
Um, and there again, there are some vineyards that were established, what I think in the 1970s, um, but you've also been planting um, some, new, some new vineyards there yourself as well. Yeah, and, and you know, things go really fast because when probably five years ago, um, we were planting a Chardonnay there and a bit of Pinot Gris and so, and um, this year we planted uh, Pinot Noir again because 2018, 19, 20 makes us think, okay, even as we weren't very sure that Pinot Noir there was a good idea, but more and more we say, hmm, finally, maybe climate change goes faster than we were thinking. And yeah. in 10 years from now, every year there will be a good year for Pinot Noir. Yeah, yeah. Um, and actually, I just wanted to, if I move the uh, presentation on a little, you can see why we called it the Lich, Um, because these are the original vines, I think, that are planted on this um, slightly, slightly unusual trellising system, um, which I, is called the Lyre. Is that right, Christoph? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Sumi, um, this wine was shown um, at the portfolio. We did a digital portfolio tasting back in February and we showed it then, um, hoping that we'll have some listings coming through. So um, I'll check and come back to you on that point. Thanks very much. Um, great. And let's um, go on. I'm, I'm, we're sort of cantering through, but I'm aware that it's getting on for uh, 10 to 3. So shall we move on to the last wine and I shall reverse back through my... So then we go to Iranski. I shall reverse, I shall do something. Not sure what I've done now. Which is um, 30, 40 kilometers north of Dijon. And by the way, far uh, more west. And um, but here, Iranski uh, is very different because they are, the village is a bit lower than Côte d'Or because you're big up north and historically it was harder to really uh, ripen there. And um, it's Kimmeridgean soil, so Chablis soil. And finally, what's interesting, there is a hint of César because mm. also there, uh, uh, probably César was a bit overlooked before because it ripens hardly. And more and more, I think people find interest in that because it ripens now easily and brings back some backbones uh, to the reds of uh, young. Mm. That's tasty. So this is the, I managed to find some pictures of Iransi, um, showing the beautiful slopes. It looks very similar, obviously, to Chablis. But the structure of this is is really different. That what I find interesting is that it's slightly more tannic than all of the other wines we've been tasting, and at the same time, compared to most of the Pinot Noir from Burgundy, we are tasting from vintages like 2007, 2008, or what you were tasting in old vintage like 2004 and things like that. The tannins even here are very soft compared to all that we used to have in Burgundy. But it's it is it's grippy. It's it's but it's beautifully fresh. I think that's tasting just lovely. It's it's actually quite a long time since I last tasted this wine. And Iran Sea is is again it's one of those I think undervalued, underrated wines of. Um, of greater Chablis, if you like. Yeah, probably Chitri and places like that. Mm. I think, you know, most of the places that used to be a bit overlooked are probably the, 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 now the rising star and the shining stars of tomorrow, you know. We do Blagny and I, I know, I remember tasting with all of our Meursault Premier Cru and Puligny Premier Cru and Chassagne Premier Cru of 2015. And the best ones were 
Chassagne, Grande Montagne, and Merceau Blagny, which are at the very top of the hill, they used to be considered second rated uh, premier cru. But nowadays, they're a bit fresher, they're a bit higher, and they make soft. In Boost Hot Vintage, a better balance, probably. And it's the same for all those places, you know. Yeah, yeah. Things are moving, and they're moving very fast. In incredibly fast. Um, so I think I think this was really a, a really interesting exercise for certainly for me, and I hope for everybody else um, in the uh, in the audience um, tasting through these wines. Um, any questions or comments that you have? Um, please um, feel free either now to chuck them into the chat um, or unmute yourself. I'm going to stop sharing. Let's manage not to muck up the technology. Um, but thank you so much, Christoph. That was, I think that was fascinating. Um, and uh, I hope everybody enjoyed that overlook from south to north of, um, of what Louis Latour and Simone Fevre are up to. Um, in trying, in their quest to try and bring you um, affordable Pinot Noir and keep you drinking um, delicious lip smacking Pinot Noir. Um, so can I say thanks to Christoph for your time this afternoon um, and thanks to the Circle of Wine Writers for inviting us to, um, to lead you through this journey of discovery. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And on behalf of the circle, can I add our very sincere thanks uh, to you, Christoph, and to you, Kate, because um, it's been a fascinating session. Um, I like the to and fro between the two of you, which uh, it makes it much more human when we in these days when we can't meet face to face. And the wines were fascinating. Um, I've I've been to Valmoisine and. Uh, it's incredible what's going on there. It is just so interesting from the experimental point of view. And the result is, um, as Charles said, it's it's a wine which you have to sell and you sell it at such an appealing price. So compared to, um, uh, well, it's very different from uh, something like the Fissant, but there, there are so many aspects of Pinot Noir. And with Louis Latour, you can start at 14 pounds and then move up to... Uh, very high prices and it's all just wonderful so oh, we're really grateful thank you very much indeed great pleasure thanks very much thank lovely, you. lovely to see everybody as well hope you're all well